readings for today. The first is from the Gospel of Matthew in the 25th chapter. <clears throat> for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see a stranger and invite you in or need clothing and, clothe, and to clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did to one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Our second scripture reading from the Gospel of John in the 13th chapter. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set you on an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Finally, in the book of Romans, in the 12th chapter, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourself. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be found pleasing and acceptable in your sight. You, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, I am glad that Matthew's gospel is very clear cut. He continues to draw these lines that no doubt tell us who we are and on which side we are. For him, there is no question. It is all pretty simple for the writer of Matthew. He says, feed the hungry, give the thirsty something to drink, clothe the naked, welcome the stranger, care for the sick. He is just so sure, he's so clear, but that's not been my experience in life. I wish it were that easy, as if there was a checklist that we were to follow, categorizing people as either a sheep or a goat, those who care <coughs> for the least of these and those who do not. But it's not that easy. It is not that easy, at least for me. And I suspect maybe not for you as well. At a previous church, I was on my way home from running errands, and I had stopped at a stoplight in the town. It was actually in the square of town. And a young man was walking across the street. 
just in front of my car in the crosswalk. And I recognized him as one of the least of these. I recognized <coughs> him as the guy who had come to my office just a few days before. I recognized <coughs> him as the same guy who had come to my office five or six times over the last few <coughs> weeks. I recognized him as the one who had said, I will not, that I said to him, I will not help you and you need to leave. So, am I a goat according to the scriptures? Am I accursed? Am I bound for eternal punishment? I don't know. Because I also recognize him as the same guy who came by the church six or eight months prior to that and had said to him, you are always welcome here. Let me get you some food. How can we help you? What do you need? So was I being good and righteous then? Bound for eternal life? I don't know. It is as easy as that to categorize ourselves as either a sheep or a goat. The reality is we are both. We are both. And I'll bet you have a story much like mine. Now I've left out some of the details there. But I'll bet that each of us has a story just like mine. Maybe another time when you drove past someone and you looked away and pretended like they were not there, that you didn't see that man or that woman holding up a sign asking for food, for work, for some kind of help. I can tell you all of the reasons why I did what I did, why I helped one day but not another. I could defend and justify my choices, but all of my expectations would be based on the other guy's story, his circumstances, and that's not what I want to do today. It's about telling the truth about my life and about your life it's about getting really real with our stories, with our lives, with our circumstances. I might wonder whether he was scamming me, but maybe better, a better question is, Am I scamming him or scamming God? The least of these always seems to have a way of being revealed to us. Most profoundly, the truth of who we are and what our life is about. They do a lot for us and help us to direct our attention to where it needs to be. There are a lot of the least of these in our world and maybe in our lives. And 
they don't always seem to fit the stereotypical image of who are the ones who have needs. Sure, it might be some guy on the street corner asking for a handout. It might be a welfare mother asking for food or the guy who had just gotten out of prison. Sometimes though, it is the one who lives under the same roof as we do. The person sitting across the table from us. You see, it's not always physical needs that need to be met. Sometimes those needs are emotional or spiritual. The least of these are in all of our relationships. They are the people over whom we have power and control. They are the ones who have less resources and options than we do. They are the ones who are overwhelmed by life and underwhelmed by support. They are the ones who feel that they are literally hanging on by a thread. And they look at us as if we are holding the scissors. They are the ones that we can either be threatening towards or the ones who can reach out and help. Who are the least of these in your life? Some are anonymous. Some might be sitting across this room from you. I think we all want to make a difference. We want to make a difference in the lives of others. We want to make a difference in the world around us. We want to make a difference in the church. Maybe that's why we sometimes struggle with our decisions and our choices Maybe it's the reason we ask for guidance from other people. Should I do this? It's the reason that we pray for God's will. <clears throat> Deep down, we really do want to make a difference. We want to do what is right. Well, I have some good news for you today, and I have some bad news for you today. We don't have to try to make a difference. You can quit trying. You already are making a difference. That's the good news. Well, here's the bad news. I don't know if it's good or ill what we do. I don't know. The people gathered for judgment in today's gospel had no idea what a difference they were making. They were just going about their everyday lives. One cared for the least of these, the other didn't. They seemed oblivious as to the consequences 
or the effects of their actions. They ask the same question, what do you see? What do you see? Do you see Jesus? Maybe you don't. You and I, as people of faith, you and I, as United Methodists, who have taken the vows of church membership, are called to reach out and to care for the least. You and I are called to make a difference. Sometimes that's a very obvious thing for us to do. Other times it takes a little bit of time. <clears throat> And if we are really honest with ourselves, if we really look deep down inside, we will see our humanity and our inhumanity. Because sometimes we're willing to do what needs to be done. Other times, not so much. You and I are called to look at the world and to see Jesus in all people. One of the challenges that I have in my uh, life as, as a pastor is when the guy comes to the door at the church and wants something but you're not sure what that something is. And you're not sure if you have the resources to get what that person needs or can make a difference in their lives. I can't tell you the number of times that that has happened. In one of my previous communities, uh, there was a ministerial uh, group of pastors that served churches in that community of all denominations, and um, uh, they were at that time of year. This was the one meeting that everybody was present for in this group. Everybody came to this meeting. Well, unfortunately, I couldn't be there because uh, my dad had a doctor's appointment. And so I wasn't able to be there for that meeting and nobody clued me in that that was the meeting that you were supposed to attend. Because it was the meeting where they elected officers to lead the group for the coming year. I figured I didn't have much to worry about, so I wasn't planning on, you know, running a campaign for one of those offices. And um, I come back from said doctor's appointment to a phone message at the church saying, congratulations, Ruth. <laughs> you need to go talk to Father Len. was a little <clears throat> worried about that conversation. Why would I need to go talk to the priest at the Catholic Church? Not that that was a problem because, you know, I was used to that. I liked him. He was a nice guy. <clears throat> he gave me grief every time he saw me because I couldn't call him Jim, uh, which was his name. I always referred to him as Father Lang because, well, I went to a Catholic high school and that's just what you call a, you know, a priest, you, you know, and I couldn't break the habit after all the years. Pun intended on that, by the way, habit. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Anyhow, uh, Fun Lang was never, never around, so um, I, I figured it would be easier just to drive down to the local uh, uh, area where he hung out 
because he was always out and about. And uh, he saw me getting out of my car because I spied him coming out of the um, Circle K with a cup of coffee. And that's okay because I was going into the Circle K to get a cup of coffee. And so in the parking lot, he said, I'm so glad to see you. Congratulations. Why, I re requested, why? He said, you are now the new treasurer of the Ministerial Association. And I looked at him and I said, but that's your job. And he said, not anymore. <laughs> not anymore. It's your job. You didn't show up for the meeting. So, you know, tag your it sort of thing. And he reached into his jacket pocket and he pulled out and handed me the checkbook. And said, here you go. Good luck. I'm not a very good record keeper. Boy, was that an understatement. <clears throat> um, and so I said, well, like, do you have parameters around what you, how you do? Nope. Well, how do people know when to find you? Oh, they'll find you, he says. I've already told a couple people that, you know, starting next week, you're in charge, so they'll find you. And so it began. I said, well, do you have any, any paperwork? Oh yeah, I got paperwork for you. This is, I'll drop it off at the church. Mm -hmm. He brought me a box. full of stuff. Everything was in there. Once I sorted through it all, everything was in there for years. Things were in there. And so it began. We went to the bank and he signed off on the checkbook and I signed on to the checkbook. And I swear to you this day that word got out because as soon as I left the bank, and returned back to my church. Somebody was there needing assistance. Now, he did give me a little bit of direction. He says, now there are certain things that, that I don't, you know, we don't have the funds to handle. He says, so never spend more than what's in the checkbook. Okay. And he says, uh, I, I try to, you know, um, spread the wealth around. So, I, I, you know, and he's giving me these little directives that really don't carry much weight um, until the person showed up at the door and needed uh, money to help meet their rent or they were going to be evicted. Or the next day when someone showed up and they needed help paying for their life-sustaining medication. Or the person who needed some help with groceries to feed their four children. Or the man who recently was released from jail and was just trying to figure out what came next. And so on and so on it went. I learned a little bit in that time as treasurer of that community's outreach ministries what it meant to give to others to serve the least 
the lost, the lonely in town. Some of them didn't show up because they needed a financial handout. Some of them just showed up because they needed somebody to talk to. Some of them showed up because they had a question about faith. Can, can, can God really love me because of the things that I have done in my life? or the things that I have un left undone in my life. You see, some of the people who have the greatest needs are not the ones with the financial needs. They are the ones with the spiritual and emotional needs. And their lives can get a little messy. And they're just looking at us to say, help me clean up the mess. Sometimes it's easier for us to simply hand out an envelope with some money in it or a check to a utility company to cover the bill for the month. It's a little more challenging when we are called to do something more. I had the great privilege of um, taking several, several youth groups on mission trips. And um, one particular church, they had a long history of going on mission trips. And they also um, would go to places where they would fix roofs and build rooms and you know do that kind of work put porches on all that kind of mission work and so they decided that you know they wanted to do a different kind of mission trip the next year that was what they gave me when i first went to the trip yep there is the youth want to do a mission trip but they want to do something different what might that look like well, I found something different. We went to inner city Chicago and we worked in the mission field in inner city Chicago. There were no, there were no porches built. There were no roofs that were repaired. There were no rooms that were added on. We worked in different kinds of settings like soup kitchens, like transitional housing centers. And the kids struggled with that because they were used to just being able to physically see at the end of a week what they had accomplished. Sometimes the service we give, we cannot see the results. Scripture tells us sometimes we plant seeds, sometimes we water them, sometimes we see the harvest. But nonetheless, we are called to do the work and the ministry of the church. It's one of our membership vows. To support the church with our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. <coughs> I leave you with this. We all have a choice to make. A choice of the ways in which we will serve the Lord. Serve the Lord. Serve the Lord. Amen.